Okay, uh, welcome. Uh, well, hello, everyone. Uh, Kayla is the first uh, or the third of three speakers we've brought from the Adirondack region. I think if you've been here before, you may have uh, you have, may have come to Tyler or Brendan's talk. Um, so one of the things that we have done as as part of the program is try to bring people from the Adirondacks here and and speak here in Rochester. Um, Kayla has worked for the Adirondack Mountain Club for eight years, and uh, I'm told that six of those years she's worked in the Summit Steward Program, where she's now the, uh, the, the Summit Steward Coordinator, um, although I heard that she has a different title for that. Uh, I think she's known as Supreme Leader within her <laughs> group of friends. So, um, Kayla's here to talk uh, not really about the program so much, but about uh, the impact of weather uh, and the winter weather on the alpine, uh, alpine ecology. So, Kayla, thanks for coming, and here you go. Thank you all for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, yeah, so this is going to be a 45-minute talk. If you, you know, need to get up and use the bathroom or, you know, do whatever, feel free to take care of your needs. Um, if you have a question about a specific slide, feel free to raise your hand. Um, but if you have a more general question, we just ask that you um, leave it towards the end. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about winter alpine ecology, um, and at the end I'll throw some stuff in about the Summit Steward Program, of course. I can't not talk about that, too. So um, I always like to give a definition of the alpine zone, what it is that we're talking about. Um, so the alpine zone is the place above tree line where specially adapted alpine plants grow. So here in New York State, we have 173 acres of alpine habitat, and that's spread across 21 summits. So um, I want to kind of take you on a journey up into the alpine zone, um, what it means to go higher in elevation. So um, for every 1,000 feet that you climb, um, it's like driving 500 miles north. So if you think of starting at your hike at the Adirondack Lodge and climbing Mount Marcy or Algonquin, climb, you're climbing about 3,000 feet of elevation. So that's like driving 1,500 miles north. So you're getting into Labrador and places like that. Also, for every 1,000 feet you climb, it gets colder. Three to five degrees colder for every 1,000 feet. And it also, um, it, you get more precipitation. So it's an increase of um, eight inches annually of precipitation for every thousand feet you climb. So what does that mean for biological life? What does it mean for the plants? Even, even plants that are really well adapted to um, these kind of conditions, it does, um, it does affect them. So the biology, there is a decrease in um, photosynthesizing and um, a conversion of carbs into new growth. So there is a decrease in that. Also, there's a reduction in chem chemical processes. So um, slower rock weathering, um, slower release of minerals and nutrients in the soil, slower decomp, that sort of thing, nutrient turnover. Um, also, for it being wetter, that means that the nutrients that are in that soil gets leached out and kind of travels down the mountain to lower elevations. So when you do begin your hike, um, you're at around 2,000 feet um, at the Adirondack Lodge, um, and you're in a northern hardwood forest. So um, the main trees that you see, you see birch, you see beech, and maple. Those are kind of the three um, main trees. As you start to kind of climb higher, what do you guys notice um, with the trees? Do you want to raise their hand? Take a guess. They start getting twisted. They start getting twisted when you get quite a bit higher in elevation, definitely. Um, do you notice anything with this pic picture? Yeah, 
so when you get more of those evergreen trees, the higher you go in elevation. So in the northern hardwood forest, you're looking mainly at deciduous trees, but then as you start to climb higher, you start to get those evergreens creeping in. Around 3,500 feet, you enter the spruce fir zone, um, so it's exactly how it sounds. It's, it's red, spurs, red spruce and um, balsam fir. And um, the kind of deciduous tree that continues up is the paper birch. And um, again, when you climb higher, you start to get uh, those nutrient poor conditions. Um, but the spruce fir zone and the alpine plants are adapted to kind of handle those conditions. Um, and it makes sense to be an evergreen um, at higher elevation because you don't have to use energy every year um, to leaf out. And you can also start photosynthesizing um, earlier. You get a head start for it. So right now in the spruce fir zone, um, March, you, get, you can start to get trees photosynthesizing. Also, the spruce fir zone can withstand really cold temperatures. So they can withstand temperatures as cold as negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, or colder without injury. So um, they're pretty well adapted. As you get higher and higher, when you hit crumpled, um, it's the gnarly trees like we were talking about before. So um, crumpled is German for crooked wood. It's when the trees start to get shorter and shorter, um, start to grow bonsai and very gnarled. Um, and that really is because of the pretty harsh weather conditions that I'm going to talk about that occur um, up in the Alpine zone. So you get tree line, it really depends on the mountain, um, but anywhere from 3,800 um, to 4,500 feet of elevation. And it really actually does depend on the harsh mountain conditions. Then you hit tree line, you get this awesome um, side that lets you know that you're entering the alpine zone it's a pretty fragile place so you want to stay on trail and off of the plants and then you enter the alpine zone um, so again we have 173 acres spread across 21 summits um, and 27 rare threatened and endangered species so i do want to talk about the glacial history, how these plants got here. Um, they got here because of ice, and um, then go into kind of the, the harsh mountain weather. So um, during the last ice age, the Pleistocene epoch, um, the glaciers carved out um, the Adirondacks and New York, um, and the ice was a mile high on the mountains, two miles high in the valley. Um, and really carved out this whole area. And when the glaciers started to retreat about 12,000 years ago, um, what they had left with them from the north was um, chunks of alpine vegetation and seeds. And really, that was the first thing to be able to recolonize after the glaciers started to recede. So Rochester was completely covered in alpine vegetation almost all of New York, everywhere that the, the glaciers um, touched were covered in alpine plants. So Rochester looked like this, um, looked like our summits. And then the trees slowly started to move back up from the south and recolonize, but where the trees couldn't grow were the summits. And that's why these alpine plants remain there today. So um, these are really kind of, it's kind of like a living natural history museum. These are kind of these ancient relics um, from glaciated times, which is pretty cool. So next I kind of want to talk about the, the crazy conditions. So does anyone know um, where the fastest recorded wind speeds, surface wind speed, it used to be, it was, it actually was broken, but does anyone Washington. know? Mount Washington, definitely. So, does anyone know how fast? 231. Yeah, so 231, um, and yeah, so pretty, pretty crazy wind speeds, right? Um, so the White Mountains, Mount Washington,
Washington, um, we have pretty similar um, weather um, in the Adirondacks. It's not as harsh, but um, we still get pretty fast wind speeds. So on White Face, they recorded um, 150 mile per hour winds. Um, and just to kind of give you an idea, we get hurricane force winds every month of the year on the summits. Every month they deal with 75 mile per hour winds. Um, we also get over 100 mile per hour winds um, each year, mainly during the spring and the winter. Um, our, when those wind gusts are at its toughest. Um, also, with the wind, is it um, causes wind chill, so it makes it even colder up on the summit. So you can get in the winter with wind chill negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit up on the mountains, um, which is is pretty pretty cold. So if you think of the winds up there, um, that's why the trees just can't grow on the summits. If you think. Um, about a big maple tree, it just wouldn't survive those crazy winds. Um, it would pick up um, any sort of um, soil, or you know, in the winter, it picks up snow particles, and that really acts like a sandblaster. So, um, alpine plants in the winter, it's good to be under the snow because um, that really saves them from that um, abrasion from um, the winds and desiccation. Other harsh conditions is the ice. So up on the summits, we get 60 days frost free. Only two months um, where it is frost free on the summits. And if you think about an ear of corn, that takes about 90 days to maturity. So alpine plants can be seen as the sprinters of the plant world. Um, they really only have the, those two months to be able to store energy, um, bloom, you know, reproduce fruit, um, a very, very short window to be able to do that. Um, what you kind of see here is ice. So this is rime ice. And rime ice is when um, molecules, water molecules freeze on a surface. Um, and so this is the reason why the Krumholtz is so gnarled. Um, you can usually see um, the trees where half of the tree is missing all of its branches. Um, and that's because rime ice has formed on those branches and then the wind has just knocked those black branches clear off. So this is the anemometer on white face. So uh, I have a question for you guys. Which direction do you think the wind was coming from? Do you think it's coming from this side, hitting it here? Or do you think it's coming from this side, hitting in this? So it's actually coming from this side. Um, so rime ice actually builds into the wind. Um, and what's neat though, if you look at the crumpled and it's missing one side, um, you know that the prevailing wind is coming from that direction. So it's a really cool way to kind of read the landscape. Um, but rime ice can accumulate three to six inches an hour, so pretty quickly. Um, definitely really harsh conditions, and that really is what's keeping the tree line at bay up there. Snowpack. So snowpack actually, um, like I was saying kind of previously, it, it's good to be under the snow. Um, it's good to be on the leeward side of the mountain because um, you are, so when you're covered under the snow, it acts as an insulating blanket, so it protects the plants, um, and kind of creates this tiny microclimate um, in the snow, and um, it really actually shapes the alpine plant communities on the summit. So, I'm gonna go over just kind of the different plant communities next, and how kind of the wind and ice um, and snow all play a part in shaping these different plant communities. <clears throat> so first here we have the said dwarf shrub diapensia community. The wind is high to medium, so you're getting, you're seeing these communities um, 
the windward side of the mountains. So it's the harshest conditions um, that these, that community plant type has to deal with. Um, you get very little snow because the wind's blowing it all away, really just getting ice, um, seeing a lot of ice to little snow. And it's on the upper north and west sides of the slopes. Um, really, you can see that that's, that's where the weather is primarily coming from. Um, the next community type is um, alpine heath. Most of the alpine plants are um, heath plants. You have wind that's mid to low. Um, the snowpack is deep, but it does melt pretty early. Um, and elevation around 3,800 to 4,800. Then you have the alpine snowbank communities where there's very little wind. It's on the leeward side of the mountain. Um, you have the deep snow, um, late and very late melting snow, and you're getting that around 4,400 to 5,300. <coughs> you have alpine rumholds. Um, very little snow and very deep, or very little wind and deep snow. Um, elevation around 3,800 to 4,500. Again, I was saying it depends. And then the mountain sandbore community. That's really, um, mountain sandbore is a pioneer species that I'll go into a little bit. Um, so this picture right here, this is a prime example of sedge dwarf shrub diapensia community. Um, one thing I will say is that if you go to other northeastern alpine areas, they do um, divide these community types up. Um, so in places like the White Mountains, you'll have like the sedge or shrub community and the diapensia community being two different ones. Because we have such a small alpine zone, we kind of group it together. Um, you'll also see um, in the Vermont, they just have like alpine meadow and sometimes in our alpine zone you'll kind of see that difference you'll see places where there's really just like diapensia not the like rose bay and then you'll see other areas that are just alpine meadows but um, for the Adirondacks um, the New York Natural Heritage Program just kind of clumped them together. Do you have a question? Uh, tell us which is, what's the diapensia? Sure, sure. So the diapensia is the um, the White. No, I have a clicker. Where did that clicker go? Just a little, little functions. There we go. So diapensia is um, these white flowers here, and I do have individual pictures that I can go more into it. Um, the Lapland Rose Bay are these pink flowers, and then the sedges are going to be like this deer's hair scent, and um, you can see little bits of big low sedge going through. But the next couple flower uh, pictures will, will definitely clear that up with what's what. So here are the sedges. Um, we got deer's hair sedge. Um, and this is Bigelow's sedge. So these sedges are ma mainly the kind of grass communities that you see are going to be sedges. Um, sedges have edges, rushes are round and straight to the ground, and then um, grass has joints when the cops are around. That's a way to remember it. <laughs> um, but the, these are um, blooming beginning of June. This beautiful clump is diapensia. Um, it doesn't have a common name, it's just diapensia of Um It is a cushion plant, so um, that helps to make it aerodynamic. Um, it also, because it's this compact um, mass, it retains heat. So if you were to stick a thermometer right inside, it'd actually be 15 degrees warmer than the outside. And again, these, these plants are on um, um, the windward, harshest parts of the mountain. So this right here, this is needle ice. This is an example of frost heave. So um, needle ice occurs when the ground is super saturated and um, it's going, you'll see it a lot in the spring and in the fall um, when you're going through that freeze thaw. Um, and basically, 
um, when it's going into, when it's becoming freezing, um, the water in the ground is forming ice, and it actually push, pushes the soil up. Um, so needle needle ice it causes soil instability um, and really disperses um, the soil from the from the winds. Um, also, it can really damage alpine roots. So um, when um, when you have saplings, um, it can really dislodge them before they become established. So what alpine plants do, how they adapt to that, they actually will, um, once the seed um, goes into the ground and it starts to grow, it will do rapid root growth within the first year, and then do more above above ground um, growth the second year. So really to help it become better established. Um, still only three out of a hundred um, germinating seeds will survive a second growing season. So it's a pretty pretty harsh climate up there. Um, so this is a beautiful map of diapensia and these little pockets that you see, this is actually from needle ice. This is um, damage that occurs from needle ice. Um, this is actually a natural process. Um, so even though it's damaging the plant, it naturally occurs up there. And what will happen, little seeds from the diapensia will go into those pockets and they'll recolonize. Um, so that, that definitely is something that naturally occurs. So this is diapensia thawing itself out of the ice. The reddish um, pigment there is anthocyanin. Um, it really is, um, it helps the plant photosynthesize just above freezing. So it's, you know, it's thawing itself out of the ice and it's photosynthesizing immediately once it's out of that snow and ice. Um, it also acts as sunscreen. Um, so it helps, um, since it's higher in elevation, closer to the sun. Um, it also helps the plant um, photosynthesize when it's cloudy out, too. And plants spend, a, spend about 60% of their time in the clouds, so it's pretty helpful. And you'll see that in the spring and the fall. Um, the plant uses its stored carbohydrates from the winter um, to produce that reddish pigment. Um, so, one really interesting thing about alpine plants um, is that the flowering is actually more dependent on previous summers than the icy spring. Um, so, alpine plants will actually, because they have that short growing window, um, they'll set their buds two to four years in advance before flowering. So, they have that time to store enough energy to be able to bloom because it does take a lot of energy to be able to, um, to, be able to bloom. Um, so in the spring when the t temperatures start to warm, um, really rapid growth can occur for these alpine plants. And they'll actually grow at a deficit of carbohydrates um, up until the plant is about 75 to 95% um, percent completed for the season. So to kind of compare it to our body, it'd be like if we, um, you know, stopped eating, but you know, kept surviving, kept growing. We can we can survive without food coming in for a good chunk of time, um, but after a while, we, we are going to have to replenish our stores again. And these alpine plants, once they're almost completed growing, um, they'll start storing energy again, um, getting ready to become dormant in the winter. So this right here, this is Lachlan Rose Bay. Um, this is a rhododendron. How many people have rhododendrons in their yard? Yeah. So this is a rhododendron, um, except it's only a couple inches tall. Um, and the flower itself is about three quarters of an inch. Um, so a lot, lot smaller. And again, it makes sense to be kind of that small alpine plant because of Harsh wind. So this right here is alpine azalea. It is found um, 
only on Skylight in New York, so one mountain, and it's a cushion plant, um, and again, it has those evergreen leaves. So this plant, um, like all the plants that we've, we just previously looked at, um, blooms in the beginning of June. So this plant blooms um, June 6th, plus or minus four days, and um, it blooms for about a week. And it's actually pretty easy um, plant to miss because, you know, it's on a remote mountain, has this short window, short window um, of blooming, and it's also really small. So those flowers are actually like as big as my pinky nail. So like really, really tiny, tiny plant. Um, but yeah, those are, those are the plants that you'll see on the windward, the harshest parts of the mountain. So this is the alpine heath. Um, so this is a majority of what the alpine zone is made up of. Bilberry, you see bog bilberry everywhere. Um, it's a vaccinium, so related to um, the blueberry, and it has that um, similar bell shape of flower and leaf structure. You also see in heath communities, um, highland thrush, um, crowberry, and labrador tea. Um, so you'll actually see bog plants up on the summits, and the summits are actually referred sometimes to in, as inverted bogs. So you'll see a mixture of the alpine plants and bog plants up there. So snow bay communities. Um, so snow bay communities um, are on that leeward side of the mountain um, where the snow is pretty deep. It's on the most protected um, sides of the mountain. You'll see a mixture of um, lower elevation and high elevation plants up there. <coughs> so you'll see things like false hellebore or Indian poke, um, crinkled pear grass, narrow leaf gentian, dwarf birch. This is the narrow leaf closed gentian. Um, an Indian poke or false hellebore. Um, really, again, being covered in snow, being insulated really helps um, because you're not dealing with that exposure to the really harsh sun in the day and the really cold temperatures at night. So there's very little fluctuation because of that snow. And alpine plants are pretty well sheltered. Um, but because these plants are the last of all thaw out, you're getting them to be blooming in more in July and August, later in the season. Some more um, plants that you'll see in the snowbank communities are some more bog plants, so bog laurel, um, small cranberry, and sphagnum mosses. So alpine crumpholds at that tree line, um, you'll see balsam fir. Um, the red spruce then turns into black spruce the higher in elevation you go. You got bilberry, but you see bilberry everywhere, um, blueberry and cranberry. So mountain sandwort community, um, that, what I, like I was saying before, this is a pioneer species, um, meaning it comes in during a disturbance. So for the summits, um, that disturbance is us, it's our roots. Um, so if we step on the plants, um, it only takes a handful of time stepping out to kill them. Um, so what you get is exposed gravel and soil. Um, and these mountain, this mountain sandbar is the first thing to come in after disturbance. And then you start getting the mosses, and then the sedges, and then more shrubby plants. So really, um, this plant, its body, um, becomes soil for more plants to grow. And it is also a cushion plant. Um, you can see that in this picture here. So just really quick recap. How does winter shade the alpine zone? The glacial history, the alpine plants are there because of ice. Um, we talked about the high winds, um, the, a lot of ice and cold conditions in the snowpack. How do alpine plants do, adapt? They have those evergreen leaves. Um, they have anthocyanin, which helps it photosynthesize. Um, it has that rapid root growth and rapid growth itself for the plants, and it stores energy. 
and sets its buds two to four years in advance. So how do we protect it? So I do want to talk really quick about the Summer Stewardship Program. Um, we are a partnership. It's not just the Adelaide Mountain Club. We are partnered with the Adelaide Chapter of the Nature Conservancy and the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, all three programs, all three organizations came together 30 years ago to make this program. We are in our 30th year anniversary. Yeah. So I want to talk quickly about the goals of the program. First and foremost is public education. We're on Marcy and Algonquin every single day during the summer. We do Wright Peak five days a week and Cascade on the weekends. Um, we visit Colden twice a, twice a month. And we try and visit all the peaks that have alpine plants to do education, trail work, and research. Um, just this year was really exciting. In August, we spoke to um, we've spoken to half a million hikers since the start of the program, which is really, really exciting. We hit that milestone past August. Um, last year, we spoke to 38,033 hikers. That's with five summit stewards and 25 volunteers. Pretty crazy. Primarily on those five mountains that I mentioned. And I'm sure you guys all know about the high use that's been going on. Um, you can really see that big um, kind of uptick in hikers within the last 10 years. Um, other things that um, we do is trail work. So our trail work is focusing on delineating the trail, keeping people on the rocks and off. We also do research, so um, our research is focused on the flora and fauna in the alpine zone. Here's our photo point monitoring project where we take, have photos from the 1960s. We retake those photos every five to ten years to see how alpine vegetation um, is recovering. The really great thing is that um, the last time we did analysis was in 2009, before that big surge in hikers, what we found is no statistically significant difference between 2009 and today, which is actually awesome. That means some stewards are holding the line that we're protecting alpine plants. Um, and just to say that when we look at pictures from the 1960s to today, so much more plants, so much more recovery. Um, in huge part to Ed Kethledge with the Revegetation Program and the Southern Stewart Program. Um, that was also started by Ed Kethledge. So we are in our 30th year anniversary. We're really excited. Um, how we are celebrating is we are hosting the Northeastern Alpine Stewardship Gathering. Um, it's going to be on October 25th through the 27th, 2019, at the High Peaks Resort in Lake Placid, New York. So what this Alpine Gathering is about, it is um, a way for plan managers, stewardship groups, um, anyone who cares about the Alpine to get together, talk about the challenges, and kind of try and brainstorm solutions. Because um, the uptick in hikers, it's not just this area, it's all across in the United States, it's all across the world. So we're all dealing with the same thing. So, um, the same challenges. So we'll have um, all of the New York State DEC is going to be there. Um, a bunch of different organizations are going to be there. Um, we want to. We want you guys to come. Feel free to come to find out more. Um, so the Adam Mountain Club is hosting it, but it is also co-hosted by the Waterman Fund. If you go to their website, um, it's just watermanfund.org. Um, if you look to click on Alpine Gathering. You can learn more about this. We're really excited to be hosting it. Also, really quickly, it's important to stay on trail, not just during the summer, but also the winter. So when you go off trail, um, damage can still occur to plants, um, especially when there's little to no snow. So 
really important, stay on trail, no matter, no matter the season, um, follow those carrots that we've worked so hard to build for y'all. <laughs> I wanted to touch briefly that our climate is changing. Um, we do not know how um, climate change will affect the alpine zone. We just know that it will. Um, we know that alpine plants have dealt with warmer climates. So 5,000, 8,000 years ago, the climate was quite a bit warmer. We know those alpine plants survived. Um, so, you know, we haven't really been seeing the changes. Um, we haven't really seeing climate change affect the alpine zone too much. Um, it has been affecting lower elevation and other alpine zones around the world, um, but we, you know, we still have those main factors. We still have ice, we still have wind, um, so we haven't really seen this much tree line creep happening just yet. That's something that we are you know, doing research on. What you can do to help, do the rock walk, follow the trail, even in the winter. Spread the message of Alpine Stewardship. If you want to learn more, go to adk.org. Um, you can always volunteer. We have wonderful volunteers here. Um, Annie and Lois are both volunteers, and they're wonderful. Um, so we, we definitely appreciate the work that they do. We couldn't do it without them. And you can also donate. So you can donate to ADK, um, specifically to the Summit Steward Program. We also have an endowment. It's called the 507 Fund for Summit Stewardship. Um, you can also do, donate to that. That would um, help fund the program long term, which is something we do struggle with funding every year. Awesome. Is there any questions? Can you repeat the date of the, um, the REI purchase deal? Yeah. What, what is the date? Like yeah. The date deadline? Yeah, so um, that's going on now until um, April 8th. If you go in, if you're a member, um, even if you're not a member, I just signed up for today, it's 20 bucks and you're a member for life, which is awesome. Um, so you get discounts when you go there. Um, you buy something, um, you get a little token, and once you're going out of the store, you stick it in the Alpine, or in the um, Sub Steward ADK um, pot, and that helps us get more funding money. Um, REI is wonderful. They've been funding us. Um, this is their second year that they're going to fund us. Um, so the more tokens you put in, um, the more money we get. So, yeah. And also, I have kind of a technical question about your presentation. You, the way you define the Alpine Zone, not all of the summits, or at least all the bear summits, um, came by their or summitness that way. Is there a difference in the flora and like the, um, you know, what, what, what grows there? Yeah, so um, on the summits that you don't, um, that say Cascade for instance, which was from um, a fire, that's why it's bald, um, you'll see, you won't see those like true Arctic tundra alpine species. Um, you might see um, some other plants, kind of, we call it subalpine. Um, so you might see a little bilberry here, you might see some bob plants up there. Um, but if you're not really seeing that like, tundra that you see up on the other summits. Um, but you know what's interesting, because it is shaped by the wind and the ice, there's actually um, some smaller, like, humps off different mountains that are like 3,500 feet in elevation and have alpine plants on. So it, it is a little, it is less about elevation and more about um, is it windy enough to not have trees growing on it. The, uh, oh, the original guidebook referred to 85 acres in the Alpine Zone. Was that a low number or have you actually doubled the acreage by your work? Um, so we have not doubled um, the acreage. Um, so that, so the 173 acres is um, a more up-to-date um, look at it because both previously um, they were looking at more of the bigger alpine zones, um, but now we've found alpine plants off of like little humps here and there. Um, and also counting as even like the areas that are bare and have rock, we count it as alpine habitat. So
So even if there aren't plants specifically on that rock, we still count kind of the whole area. And that's, you know, with technology and GIS mapping and stuff like that, we've been able to really grow that number. Um, Sure, so um, that means that when you are above tree line, you want to just stay, stay on bare rock surfaces. You want to stay off of any exposed gravel and soil that you see because um, those alpine plants can recolonize and regrow in those areas. Um, and anything that is alpine vegetation, and like you saw in my presentation, that is the sedges, it's the mosses, it's the shrubs, it's literally anything that's green up there, you don't want to step on. Um, so yeah, so there um, is, um, if, so there's map lichen that is, um, that is on the rock that like really takes a lot of stepping on to even get it off, or it comes off with like soda, like it, it takes something, you know, pretty harsh to be able to take that off. Um, but if you have lichen that is growing like on top of the rock, um, and that can become dislodged, you do want to stay off of that. So you get like crustose and um, different lichen like that that attaches itself to the rock. Um, you want to not walk on that. So if it looks like you can scuff it with your boots, don't walk on it. But if it looks like it's almost part of the rock, um, for the most part, that, that's pretty good to walk on. And you'll see map lichen is covering like all of the rocks on the summit, except where people spilled soda. <laughs> Showed the, uh, the graph of the um, currently of uh, Lago hikers and such. Uh, what is that uh, specifically on? I'll call it the, only the popular peaks, or is it getting into the other areas? And in either case, what do you attribute the increased uh, visitors to? Sure. So. Um with the, so it is mainly on those four to five summits that I talked to, that's where we spend most of our time. Um, we have, um, we do go to a lot of other peaks. Um, we do also do a graph, which is um, a little bit more of an apples to apples comparison. Because um, really in the beginning of the program, there was two summit stewards who were out of our seat on five days a week. Um, so some of that, you know, some of that increase can be contributed to the growth of the program. Um, but when we actually look at um, what we do is we take our numbers from Marcy and Algonquin for the months of July and August, well, that was what they historically did, um, and put that on a graph, you still see this increase in hike, hiker use. So it is still, it is increasing um, across the board. Um, why that's happening, I mean, I would say, Hiking is really popular right now, um, and you're seeing, and just outdoor recreation is increasing. And um, again, this isn't this isn't a local trend. This isn't a regional trend. This is a global trend. Um, you know, I think it could be a number of reasons, but I, I think it's a good thing. I think it's a positive thing. Um, you know, it's, it might be kind of a reaction to we are losing our wild places, places that, you know, you think of growing up and you had, um, you know, woods that you played in as you were a kid and more and more of our world is becoming covered in pavement. And I think people are really wanting to go to nature um, and, really in, and get, that, get that experience. Um, you know, also social media and the internet has, has also contributes to that big boom. Um, people are learning about these wild places and see a cool picture on Instagram and now they want to go. So I would say the internet is is a part of it, but I, I think also people just want to get up and enjoy the outdoors, which is a, always a good thing. Always a good thing. Thank you.
might want to consider getting it with me because I can save you a little money on that also. And uh, that book is the second edition of 85 Acres that was sort of mentioned a little while ago. Uh, a field guide to the Adirondack Alpine Summit. So it's a book, a fairly, fairly thin book, fairly small, but it's packed with beautiful, gorgeous, close-up photos and broader scale photos of these alpine vegetation, of this alpine vegetation. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, for someone who wants to take a field guide with them, it's just the right size for your backpack and you can't miss on identification. All the proceeds to this book go to support the Summer Stream program. So half go directly to ADK um, for the year for um, the program, and then the other half goes to the 507 fund to the endowment. So all of it goes to the Summer Stream program. And it's a very well written, very good read. Uh, I think you really enjoy this particular. Mm -hmm. It's really great. Awesome. Anything else? Thank you guys so much.